iniciativa da Câmara de Comércio Brasil-Canadá, com apoio do governo canadense e o patrocínio da Air Canada. Estamos aqui agora para fazer uma, uma sessão deliciosa, lamentavelmente virtual, mas vamos procurar aqui imaginar as delícias de uma iguaria, de um vinho canadense muito especial, apresentado a Madalena Kaiser, que vem representando os produtores de vinho da região de Ontario. Hello, Madalena. It's very nice to have you here with us this afternoon to talk about the wines of Ontario, especially ice wines. Obrigada. Um, oi, um, tudo bem? I used to live in Brazil. Uh, when I was in my teen years for nine months. So that is the most of the Brazilian Portuguese that I remember. So this presentation is reminding me that I need to go back to Brazil and uh, I miss it and hopefully one day actually speak Portuguese again. <laughs> it was my first language I learned actually. So um, thank you very much. So yes, I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about uh, ice wine, Canadian ice wine, and thank you for celebrating all things Canadian this week. Uh, yesterday was Canada Day, as you all know, so, um, so I'm happy to get started as quickly as possible. I know that uh, you really only have 45 minutes, so I'm going to kind of move quickly through the presentation and um, at the end leave a little bit of time for some questions. So if you're okay, uh, I, the questions will be done by the chat. Pardon me? The, the questions will be shown at the chat. Yes, they will be done by the chat. So if anybody has a question, uh, put it in the chat and we will answer them at the end. I'll answer them at the end. Okay, so it's all yours. Okay, so I'm going to try to do the uh, share screen and I should be good. Can you see the screen? Can someone confirm that the screen is good to go? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, excellent, thank you. Uh, okay, so, um, so here we are, as we said, we're discovering the beauty of uh, this very sweet and luxurious signature, ice, uh, signature product from, from Canada. Uh, just a second, here we go. So um, we have been on the global stage for many years now for ice wine. Really, ice wine was the flagship product that really put Ontario and Canada on the map. I think that this uh, quote from Hugh Johnson, uh, one of the world's most acclaimed authors and wine writers, um, when he talks about the fact that uh, the establishment of ice wine was something that really um, moved our region and our country forward. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, and it's really continues to be an important uh, product for us. And it really opened the door for many other things that we produce as well, not just ice wine. And from the rest of the presentation, you will see that we do produce other things, even though today we are focusing only 
really on ice wine. A few more examples, and again, I'm probably going to be flipping through some, uh, some of these slides rather quickly, but uh, ice wine being the flagship and a pillar for so many years has uh, provided this an opportunity for us to talk about the other things that we do really well in Canada and uh, uh, the different parts of Canada, and those being mostly table wines, in fact. So uh, Ian Daggett, who's another writer and is, happens to be Canadian, has uh, written extensively about our region, as has people, uh, authors like Matt Kramer uh, from the US, Jamie Good from the UK. And what I've done here now is actually just included a couple of photos of what our vineyards look like in the middle of summer or in the growing season. Uh, I think it's important to know because people often think that we actually have uh, only cold temperature to produce uh, ice wine. So you actually need a proper growing season with grapes in order to get the, um, the grapes ripe and then leave them on the vine for production. So this is a, a couple of slides really just to show that to you. Uh, Here's another one, a beautiful um, example. This is one looking from the uh, Niagara Escarpment across. If you look in the far right hand corner, uh, this is looking north from the Niagara Escarpment and you can see the CN Tower across the lake in the far corner. So it really just shows you the proximity to Toronto and the Great Lake, which is Lake Ontario, uh, which again, we'll just talk about briefly when we go through some of the slides prior to uh, the next area here. So what I am going to do actually is I'm going to uh, put a, a video on right now. It's two minutes, but I think it's really important to watch because um, it, it just gives you a glimpse of uh, in two minutes exactly what ice wine production is all about. So hopefully this works. I'm going to press play and we can watch it now. Watch that. I'll be right back. Canadians may not have invented ice wine, but they have perfected it. Today, Canada is the undisputed global leader of this unique and rare sweet wine, a quintessentially Canadian product. The quality and quantity of Canadian ice wine has continued to rise. And the world, it seems, can't get enough. The secret, of course, is Canada's extreme climate. Every year, winemakers are guaranteed the right conditions to produce ice wine, and not a single harvest has been missed in over 30 years. By law, the temperature must be at least minus 8 degrees Celsius or colder for several hours to ensure that grapes are frozen solid before pressing. This happens under darkness of night, and growers are forever searching for willing harvesters. In an ideal season, grapes will go through several freeze and thaw cycles before harvest, which helps to build complexity. And harvest often happens well into the new year. Once harvested, the rock hard bunches are then put into vertical presses. The resulting juice is not only rich in sugars, but also acids critical for ice wine's marvelous balance and extract, the precursors to ice wine's celebrated complexity. Canada now exports ice wine to over 100 countries, and production in the last 10 years alone has nearly doubled. Ontario accounts for 90% of this total. Ice wine is best enjoyed, like all sweet wines, with a chill, but not ice cold allow its aromatics to unfold in the glass. Ice wine, Canada's quintessential wine. Experience some today. Okay, so uh, hopefully that gives you some insight on the visuals of ice wine production, which I think is a great way to start because it's really difficult to visualize, even people who are studying about ice wine. Um, and so next, I really just want to give you a, an overview really of Canada as a wine producing country. Uh, as you can see, we're looking from British Columbia on the West Coast 
to Nova Scotia on the East Coast and in between Ontario, which is where I am, and then also between Ontario and Nova Scotia, we have Quebec. So essentially, um, Ontario is the largest uh, planted area in Canada, and then next is British Columbia, and then with quite a, quite a lot less is Quebec, and then uh, slightly less than that is Nova Scotia. So all producing uh, wines with certain consistencies, uh, considering our climate and our latitude and so on, but certainly there's diversity within the regions. And so um, ice wine, actually where we'll take you is the next slide is, uh, and, and before I do that, actually, perhaps I'll just say that close to 600 wineries all across Canada in total, uh, sprinkled through the different regions. And the next slide really just shows you a little bit more information on ice wine production specifically. And so while we might, if anyone really knows about Canada, uh, Canadian wine, they usually know ice wine first. And it, it's interesting because it's really only about 5% of our production by volume. So uh, it is something we, pr we produce consistently every year in Ontario. Uh, as you heard from the video, the majority of ice wine does get produced in Ontario due to the cold winters, the regular cold winters. That doesn't happen as consistently in, in any of the other regions. Uh, but again, you can see the break down here um, with the producers in each region. So because Ontario is really the, the primary production area, we're going to focus a little bit more on Ontario so you can understand uh, what is really happening in this region. There's 180 wineries in Ontario. Um, they're broken up between three primary appellations and emerging regions as well. And uh, typically in Ontario, we produce about 30 million bottles of wine a year, which I like to say is very close to our population. I think we're at 37 million uh, Canadians. So in Ontario, that's not ice wine, that's all wine. And from the next slide, you can see that in Ontario, we produce mostly table wine. Uh, we produce a lot of sparkling wine, actually more sparkling wine than we produce ice wine. But again, as you can see, we're here for ice wine and um, it's a very important product and we produce most of it, um, the largest producer in the world. So a quick history on Ontario wine. Um, again, there are two slides here. And um, if anyone who wants to look at the video after today or get a copy of this presentation, uh, I'm sure you'll be able to do that to look at these details. But really the modern history of Ontario is in 1975 when uh, Innes and Wines which um, got the first winery license in 50 years, started producing high quality vinifero wines. And so from that point forward, uh, many other pioneers, Shatter de Charmes, Cave Spring Vineyard, Henry of Pelham, started producing and investing in the region and producing uh, quality wine, which brings us fast forward to um, where we are today with 180 wineries. One point on this history um, slide that I'd like to point out to you though is in 1983 is when Ontario started first experimenting with ice wine and then 1984, the first commercially produced ice wine was created and uh, by the standards of grapes frozen on the vine, which is required for ice wine, for Canadian ice wine. So again, just going back to Ontario specifically, because that's where most of the ice wine is produced, it's very linked to climate. So Ontario and climatic conditions. So latitude is one factor for sure. Uh, lakes is another. Um, you saw in the photo how close we are to Lake Ontario and how large Lake Ontario is. So back to latitude though, we are actually uh, very similar in latitude to Tuscany, Italy which is much more south than realized. And as I mentioned earlier, we need a, a growing season in order to produce the grapes to, to make ice wine eventually. The lakes are really important because we are a, a continental climate that's moderated by these lakes. And if we didn't have the lakes, it would be too cold to actually ripen the grapes. Limestone is another factor that we like to talk about. Uh, 
in the sense that soil is really important for the character of wine. And we have limestone, uh, different types of limestone. Most of it is dolomitic, which is very old and provides certain characteristics of grapes when you're uh, growing grapes. Again, quickly looking at the latitude, and I'm going to go a little quickly through some of these because we're trying to get to the slides specifically about ice wine. This talks about growing degree days and, uh, and that we actually are much warmer than people realize during the summer. Our growth cycle, again, I think we won't really touch on this slide today because of the timing. A closer look at the, the Great Lakes that we talked about, they're very deep lakes. It's the greatest, uh, largest freshwater system in the world. So they really actually act as oceans and uh, do not freeze, at least four out of the five don't freeze uh, because of their, they are so deep. Uh, again, just touching on the history of the soils, uh, Ontario and Canada, um, saw many, many uh, ice ages and a lot of glacial erosion has happened. So there's um, glacial till and complex soils due to the history of these glaciers. So VQA is an important thing to remark on. Uh, the Vintners Quality Alliance is an appellation system, but what it really does for consumers is it provides information to them uh, that the product is 100% grown in Ontario, for VQA Ontario. And with respect to ice wine, the VQA label is, um, is the only national standard for a product. So when you see anywhere in the world that VQA is on the label for ice wine, you know that it's authentically Canadian. Cool climate varieties uh, grow best here. And um, again, I won't really go in depth here because what I'd like to talk about is the varieties that we produce ice wine from, which are in some slides moving along, further along. Another thing I wanted to mention though, is that because of the cold climate, cool climate that we have in the winter time, it's uh, while we have the growing season, we also have very, very cold conditions that are needed to actually produce ice wine. But there are challenges with that in order to protect the vines because Ice wine is produced at a certain temperature. It has to be negative eight degrees Celsius, but once it gets colder, it's hard to actually get the juice that you're, uh, we're looking for from ice wine. Um, and then when it gets really, really cold, uh, up to negative 22 or negative 24 degrees Celsius, you can actually have not only vine damage, but you can actually have vine death. So in Ontario, especially, we have um, things uh, to, to help with that, one being wind machines, which is shown on the left-hand side. And wind machines have been very, very helpful in um, reducing frost, uh, frost, excuse me, frost damage. Also, there's something called geotextiles, which basically look like warm, fuzzy blankets that you put on your vines in the fall, and you cover them and protect them, and then in the spring, you unveil the vines. So that particular picture actually shows you, uh, the one on the right was a vine uh, this spring actually that came out from under the blanket and that same day, a photo was taken with a vine that wasn't covered with a blanket. So you can see the difference uh, from that type of product protection. This talks about our sub-appellations. Again, I think just for the purposes of time, we will uh, move through these. And I apologize. I just want to make sure that we get enough time with ice wine. So here we are at Canadian ice wine. Canada did not invent ice wine, but we have become the leading producer of ice wine globally. And we produce it consistently every year since 1984 when it was produced commercially first. It's produced by a number of different varieties and uh, it's so consistent that it is actually seen quite regularly now on some of the most difficult wine exams in the world. So it's definitely a benchmark product uh, style for uh, this type of sweet wine. So character and, so and style. We're going to get into some other slides, as I mentioned, which will go into a little bit more um, discussion about some of these things. But essentially, 
probably the most obvious thing is that it is a sweet wine. So often categorized as a dessert wine, which is very much the truth, but with sweet wines, like other sweet wines in the world, uh, Sauterne from France or Madeira or sweet sherries can um, provide not an opportunity to taste or to enjoy it, not just as a dessert, but with things that, um, that are sweet, savory, or spicy. So that's what I want to talk about in the next few minutes uh, as we go to the next slide. I think we'll, we can expand on some of these things. Before that though, again, back to the history a little bit. So essentially, as I said, we did not invent it. It was invented in Germany by accident. Uh, interestingly, over the last 24 hours when we posted information about this webinar, uh, I started to get into a little bit of chat with somebody who was saying that it actually was not necessarily Germany, but it was in, in fact years and years before in um, other parts of Northern Italy. And um, so I have to do a bit more research on that, but certainly we know everyone really does give credit to Germany for perfecting it um, over the years and also Austria. In Canada, British Columbia actually made the first ice wine in Canada in 1974 in very small batches. And again, in 1984, uh, Ontario really bringing it to um, creating standards, putting them in place and commercializing it. Another thing that was in, in the 1990s, really what happened was Inniskillen won a Grand Prix d'Honneur at the Van, Van Expo in France with their 1989 ice wine. And that really was the pivotal point of, of getting attention for Canada for wine in general and certainly ice wine. Uh, 1998, uh, Carl Kaiser also invented uh, sparkling ice wine in the Charmat method, which is a bubbly um, obviously sparkling, a method of producing a certain type of sparkling wine and uh, they are one of the few people that do produce uh, sparkling ice wine still. And then George Riedel in the year 2000 actually uh, worked with Inniskillen to an event, invent a specific ice wine glass which uh, really does make the experience of ice wine its best expression of itself. So Back to uh, a few comments earlier, we need warm summers to ripen the grapes, we need healthy grapes, and we need cold but not too cold winters. So the perfect window for picking ice wine is about negative 10 to negative 12. Negative eight is the law, but if you go under negative eight, you can't actually pick. So often when people are planning picking, they pick at nighttime because they know that the sun won't come out in the middle of the night and warm up uh, one or two degrees where they would have to stop picking. So most, um, so most ice wine is actually picked from about midnight till three, well, probably four or five in the morning. So it's, it's quite an interesting process. I've done it myself a number of times. It's, it's fun for a little while and then it's, uh, it's hard work. <laughs> so, if you have an opportunity one day, I welcome you to try. Um, it's certainly a beautiful experience, a once in a lifetime type of experience. And actually this next slide does show that, uh, nighttime, early morning. Um, also either picked by hand, some people still pick by hand, and many people also pick by machine. I would say with ice wine, you know, machine doesn't really have um, whether it's hand or machine, the, the grapes are essentially frozen and almost as hard as a marble. So machine picking is much more efficient, much quicker. It's, it's, uh, it needs to be done quickly because of the short window. So it's actually reduces the risk if people use machines to, to pick. Uh, again, I, I won't stop on this slide too much because I think a lot of the, um, the video kind of talked about the harvest um, and the methods. For people that are studying wine, they might be more interested in the details of the regulations, uh, which this slide does include. And certainly if anyone has any other questions about that, I'm happy to expand upon it um, and discuss that separately.
So there are three uh, main varieties that are used in ice wine production or have the most uh, volume, I would say. So the Dow is by far the largest um, production grape variety that we have. And then Riesling next, and then Cabernet Franc, which is a, a red grape variety. Certainly there are many other varieties that producers have made, including Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer, uh, Kerner, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, other reds as well. And so they all have very unique characteristics. But these three, and I have three in front of me as well, which if we have enough time at the end, I'm going to check my clock here um, to taste. I will refer to those. But Vidal essentially is more, it's a richer, more luscious style. It has stone fruit character. All ice wine is, uh, it's noteworthy to say that it's really the acidity in the, uh, in the wine that provides structure in order to balance the sweetness. Uh, and of course, every variety has naturally a different type of acidity and a different level of acidity. They, it also has different fruit characteristics. So when you start to combine the actual sweetness level, the character of the fruit, the character of the acid, and the level of the acid, you get completely different expressions of this dessert wine. So tasting them alongside one another is a great opportunity to really understand the differences. Uh, as I said, Vidal is usually more of a luscious, more fruit forward, stone fruit uh, character. Whereas Riesling generally has higher acidity, naturally from the grape variety, and it has more citrus kind of candied notes. Cabernet Franc, very different because it's red to begin with. It has more like strawberry rhubarb red fruit character. Um, and we'll get to some of the comments on the pairings. Um, definitely these different ice wine grape varieties go with different types of food due to their characteristics. Just a point on serving. So generally, because it is dessert wine, it is bottled in smaller bottles. So 375 mil generally. Uh, also now wineries are producing 200 milliliter bottles, which are slightly smaller. And then, uh, and, and if you go to a duty-free shop, you can see 50 mil little um, bottles of ice wine, which are essentially uh, single serving. And so that allows you to try different varieties as well. The other thing, so essentially a smaller pour, so you might have a 200 or 375 mil might do fine for a dinner party. And uh, it's recommended that you serve it well chilled. So about 10 to, 10 to 12 degrees Celsius. You don't want it frozen. <laughs> um, no wine should really be frozen, uh, but cold enough that it's again, well chilled. Once opened, you can keep it actually for several weeks. Um, you don't need to drink it within the same day, but certainly if you're enjoying it and you can do that as well. But someone who loves it can keep it in their own home for themselves for several weeks. So again, getting back to the unexpected pairings, savory, spicy, and sweet. Sweet pairing seems the obvious, which is the case, but also um, savory and spicy I guess savory is probably the next obvious pairing, uh, but spicy is maybe the unexpected pairing. And with savory, the sweetness of the ice wine basically um, balances or goes along with rich, salty characteristics. You'll see later, uh, well, we have it here on the slide actually, blue cheese, foie gras, those things are a classic pairing that you would also maybe have with Sautern, is perfect with ice wine. Sweet, we'll go to the bottom of the slide here actually, is, is a natural, you can have ice wine by itself as a dessert or you pair it with um, a dessert that can allow both the dessert and itself to shine. Spicy again being unusual, the sweetness, and this is not maybe unexpected when you look um, at other pairings that sweet and spicy in so many cuisines, it's actually a classic interesting pairing. So I did a tasting years ago in Toronto with media and food writers where we only tasted 16 ice wine during a whole lunch uh, presentation and 
it was interesting because you almost didn't notice that the whole meal had only been ice wine because of the sweet, savory, and spicy um, food pairings that we put with, with the uh, tasting. It was really an eye-opening tasting, actually, and we, um, was, we should probably redo it. I say it every time I talk about that tasting. Okay, so, sorry, I'm flipping slides here. So again, just um, the foie gras savory concept. So we can go fancy and classic with foie gras, or if many of you may not want foie gras or like foie gras, gras um, chicken liver pate is also an option as well and much less expensive, easier to make, easier to buy. And um, trying both of these or either of these with ice wine, um, I'm sure you'll find is a classic pairing. The aged blue cheese, again, another classic pairing. And we've just put on these slides just some of the ice wines, the varieties that might pair best. Uh, but certainly it's going to depend on your own personal preference. Some people love certain varieties of ice wine better than others. And everyone wants to discover, everyone should discover their own perfect pairing depending on um, the foods that you like and and the type of ice wine that you end up liking best. Spicy curry. So again, this is an interesting, unexpected pairing. We put it, um, I've had that actually a couple of times, interestingly, with Vidal ice wine that really is a beautiful uh, combination and, and again, just something that you might consider trying. And I guess if you're in Brazil, I'm just trying to think back. I don't remember anything being specifically spicy so much. I know that you have um, a lot of barbecue um, and I know um, some of the bean. It would be interesting actually trying with uh, specifically with Brazilian cuisine. I haven't, as I said, had it recently. It's been a number of years, but I don't recall things being so spicy. So I'm not really sure. Um, from, from Brazil specifically what you might try, but that might be fun and interesting to see what it could be paired with as part of the traditional cuisine there. Spiced nuts, again, the spicy component. This is just something really simple if you wanted to try as a, an aperitif and have some ice wine and, and try something with some, a, uh, a spiced pairing. Chocolate. So again, chocolate's probably one of the classic pairings, and Cabernet Franc seems to be one of the most popular varieties to pair with chocolate. Very kind of decadent and rich, and as I said, with the character of, of Cabernet Franc ice wine, having strawberry and berries and rhubarb notes, it just is a perfect combination with chocolate. Um, chocolate and berries, delicious. Peach crumble. So this is more of a um, stone fruit uh, combination. So uh, we would lean or recommend that you might try Vidal ice wine with that because the type and the nature of the fruit character in Vidal seems to go really well with peach. We live in the Niagara region, or at least that's where I live, and that's where most of the ice wine is produced, and we produce, we grow a lot of peaches. So um, this seems to be a perfect pairing, uh, a great opportunity to um, use local ingredients and have a local product like ice wine to be paired with it. So beyond food, I guess, um, and I'm just looking at time to make sure I think we're okay. Um, so, certainly with food is is something classic but the other thing that's really interesting that has come out from over the years probably from experimentation with with bartenders uh people that love cocktails using ice wine as part of a cocktail so this is has become so popular that in niagara where we have an ice wine festival three weeks um, in January, in the middle of winter. Yes, it's kind of crazy, but anyone that's attended it from afar who's never even see, seen snow usually finds it super exciting, lots of fun. And this uh, ice wine cocktail competition um, is actually done between the local restaurants and every year they come up with some really cool ideas. So these are kind of two classics that, uh, believe me, there are many, many interesting ideas and I give uh, all of those people credit for being so creative and, and trying different things uh, for people to come 
and try and inspire them to use ice wine in different ways. So the kind of the two classics are an ice wine martini. So essentially that's super easy. You just take equal parts ice wine, equal parts uh, vodka, if you're having a vodka martini, uh, and then you stir those together, make it in a classic uh, martini way. Those are actually grapes, not olives. Uh, but again, experiment with a classic combination and use ice wine to give it a little bit of sweetness. Ice wine royale. So this one's actually Cabernet wine. So you have the red, uh, red ice wine, the red grape variety, and you use three ounces of sparkling wine. So let's say you use your favorite dry sparkling, classic sparkling wine, and um, you have an ice wine royale, and that looks like a little bit of chocolate there. Again, you can never go wrong with a little bit of, of chocolate and Cabernet Franc ice wine. And as I mentioned before, these are a couple of uh, photos from the Ice Wine Festival. Uh, we get tens of thousands of visitors every year for the month of January going, coming to visit the Niagara Peninsula in, um, in Ontario. And there's lots of programs for people to come and try ice wine and uh, visit wineries, go to the cocktail competition, and really um, learn all about this great Canadian product. So what I'm going to do now is I think I'm... That's the last slide. I'm going to take my screen share off and then I'm, I have ice wine here, but in the meantime, maybe I'll answer questions at the same time if that works for everybody. I'm going to try to do this. Nope. Is the screen share working or not? Mm -hmm. Maybe someone can unmute themselves and guide me on how to get back to the big screen. As many times I've done one of these, somehow. Okay, stop, share, here we are. I think we're good. Okay. So my understanding is uh, my Brazilian team is going to WhatsApp me some questions, which I'm looking at right now. I'm hoping that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh, Okay. All right, so there's someone named Alexandre that is asking uh, if there's a course on Canadian wines. They found one in BC and also at, which is at the, well, there is one at BC that they have an ambassador program, uh, which is more geared towards, I think there's a level one and a level two and slightly more geared towards um, like sommeliers. Uh, then they have, uh, yes, the, the Fine Vintage School puts on a Canadian wines program. And um, I think this is going to be a longer question to answer. So if you would like to email me, I can certainly help you get information on where you could get more, more information on learning about Canadian wine, if that's okay. Uh, okay, so Raphael is asking, what are the best schools or universities to study uh, enology in Canada? So in Niagara specifically, we actually have um, Covey, which is the Cool Climate Viticulture Institute, um, and at, at Brock University, which was essentially founded when the industry was, um, you know, starting to grow. And that is a four-year university program for winemaking. Uh, in addition to that, Niagara College, which is a college, not a university, uh, has a, I believe it's a two-year, and I feel there's different wine programs there. Some of them are integrated. There's the winemaking program, and then there is also um, different, different types of programs depending on if you're wanting to get into wine management or a culinary side but for winemaking i think it's two years i could be wrong it could be one year um, i think brock also has um, a shorter version of a different program not necessarily the four-year winemaking program but those are the two key that i know about um, well, we have Research Institute in, in British Columbia as well. I'm not really sure about the winemaking program there. Uh, so you caught me off guard there. So, but certainly if anyone wants to email me after the presentation, I can put you in touch and give you as much information as I can. So hopefully that answers that. And then 
Raphael's also asking, um, what are the main differences between sweet wines like Sauterne and Tokai to Canadian ice wine? So, uh, and again, maybe I'll just, because we're getting, getting really close, I just am going to, I will answer that question, but I did want to actually just briefly touch on the wines that I have in, in front of me. You did see in the video some of the ice wine. This is actually Beasling ice wine. So this is from Stratus Winery just around the corner. And actually within the ice wine category, there's different styles. So Stratus, for example, produces this ice wine, which is just about 122 grams per liter of sweetness. So it's on the less sweet side of the ice wine scale, or it's on the lower side of the ice wine scale. And if you're studying about wine, that's about the sweetness of port. Uh, I study about wine too, and I use basically port as my benchmark. And so when we look at the colors, and here is beside it, here is, I don't know if you can see, but this is a um, Vidal ice wine. So even the color is richer and darker. This is from Pilatary Estates. And then, or no, sorry, this is actually from Rife. My apologies. This is from Rife. And this is Vidal, also a pioneer in the ice wine uh, producing in Niagara. And theirs is sweeter. Theirs is just over 200 uh, grams per liter and slightly less alcohol, 10%. So when you're producing sweet wines, there's always the balance of sweetness and then alcohol because the more you ferment, um, you get less alcohol and it becomes drier. So we also have, I wanted to show you just quickly the um, Cabernet Franc ice wine, which is like pinky in color, as we were mentioning, strawberry and rhubarb. This is Pilatary Estates, which is again, one of our pioneer producers um, of ice wine. I didn't open this one, but uh, another producer just down the road uh, that, that gave me a bottle of Cabernet Franc was the hair, one of the newer wineries in Ontario. So getting back to the question though about Tokai and um, uh, Sauterne, one of the biggest differences is the fact that there is no botrytis in ice wine. So if you are familiar with Sauterne, botrytis and actually Tokai as well, it's the noble rot, the kind of um, rot that you want. It's a good rot. <laughs> it changes the character of the grape. That happens in Sautern and in Tokai differently, the way they harvest. And um, that gives character, the characteristics. For example, in Sautern, you have marmalade aromas and saffron, which are very connected to botrytis. That does not exist in ice wine because, in fact, we don't have botrytis. You don't want botrytis. Clean. So that is one marker if you're doing a blind tasting that you should definitely, definitely figure out. And then um, it's the sweetness and the acidity level, I would say, uh, is a big part of that as well. Um, certainly with Tokai, is considered the highest acid. So if you were doing a blind tasting, it is really, you know, certainly in a blind tasting, if you're having them as part of one of 12 and not realizing, you know, what you're looking at and you don't have any information, but if you're tasting them side by side, uh, you can certainly see the differences. So hopefully that does answer it. And again, I'm happy to answer any other questions. Checking my WhatsApp, because I think we're getting basically two more minutes. Um, Okay, yeah, we just have five more minutes. So uh, are there any other questions before we wrap up? Just gonna wait. Do we have in any way Botrytis ice cream? No, no. Not in quality ice wine. I, I don't know that I've ever remembered anybody really having. Um, if you have botrytis, you, you probably make a late harvest botrytis affected wine. And actually part of the reason that we don't have botrytis is that our growing conditions here actually are not really, they don't foster good botrytis because there is bad botrytis as well, which is um, something that we try to manage in the vineyard, but you need uh, certain conditions for good botrytis to actually grow. 
And so that doesn't happen here. It happens maybe in two vineyards in Niagara that I know of, uh, which don't produce ice wine. They, they actually allow that to happen in their Riesling vineyard and they make a, a Riesling out of it and there's a Botrytis character to it. Uh, but you need, usually you need a vineyard, as you know, with Saturn, if you're studying wine, you need it to be near a water body and you need certain uh, moist and then drying conditions so that rot doesn't start to happen. And so, um, again, just the way our vineyards are, our climate, we just generally don't, don't get botrytis. And so, again, it's not wanted in ice wine to begin with. So, I think I'm just checking. Uh, okay, so my email just in case anybody wants to know it, is Magdalena, which is M-A-G-D-A-L-E-N-A -A -E -A at W-M-A-O dot C-A. So that's my work email. Uh, if you're on social media and you want to communicate with me that way, I'm uh, M Kaiser Wine. And so I can certainly answer you there and get back to you with information. Um, our our um, industry website is winecountryontario.ca and uh, there's lots of great information there about ice wine. We also have this video that you saw and we'll probably be posting this presentation uh, summer as well. I think that the people here will be also posting this presentation. So hopefully I think that is um, everything. So thank you very much for taking uh, 45 minutes out of your day today in the middle of summer to learn about ice wine and cheers to Canada. Cheers to this great product and um, obrigada. Obrigado, Madalena. Thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, the, all this information with us. I think uh, it was very nice to hear about ice wine and get to know a little more about the, the process for producing. Uh, it's important to, to point out that uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Brazil, Canada, is, will be working together with uh, Canadian producers to help bringing ice wine to the Brazilian market. Uh, we have already talked about that and we, we were very happy to count with the, our cooperation and partnership to, to help Brazilians have the opportunity to experience and to taste such a, a special wine. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be wonderful. I know there are some producers that are interested, so hopefully there is an opportunity for them and they can... Excellent. So once more, thank you very much for being here with us at the Canada Day CCBC Online Festival. Obrigado a todos pela presença. E agora, na sequência, já temos uma outra palestra interessante sobre uh, internacionalização e empreendedorismo na região de Toronto. Então, uh, gostaria que quem está aqui seguindo a gente nesse evento uh, siga também as próximas palestras. Temos palestras, inclusive, até o domingo, dia 5, e no site da, do festival, aproximadamente 200 conteúdos culturais para download gratuito. Muito obrigado e até breve. Thank you very much. See you soon. Happy Canada Day. Happy Canada Day. Okay, bye-bye.